Uh, hello, my name is Brian Zhang. Um, I'll be presenting this paper with a mouthful of a title, Optimal Correlated Equilibrium and General Sum Extensive Form Games, Fixed Parameter Algorithms, Hardness, and Two-Sided Column Generation, um, which is joint work with Gabriele Farina, uh, Andrea Celli, and my advisor, Tuoma Sanho. OK, so let's break down this mouthful of a title. Um, first thing I'll do is I'll introduce what, what correlation means in extensive form games. Um, then I'll, I'll present um, two, two families of results. The first is fixed parameter algorithms. And I'll define what that means for those of you who don't, who don't know when, when I get to it. And the second is an improved method, method for column generation that works when the first algorithm is pretty slow. So, so, so they have disparate strengths and weaknesses, which I'll also summarize once I've gone through everything. And finally, I'll talk about some experiments. I'll summarize, and I'll talk about some future research. OK, so first, what is the right notion of correlation in extensive form games? To, to me, the best way to think about correlation is to think about a game played through a mediator. Now, the mediator is just a trusted third party that doesn't actually do anything except flip random coins and send messages. So the mediator has no power except, except just to tell the players what to do. The players don't need to listen to the mediator. The players can do whatever they want. The mediator can only send messages. OK, so here's our mediator. The mediator is going to sample some, some profile from some distribution. By profile, I mean simply one pure strategy for each play player. And then the game is going to begin. So we're playing an extensive form game here. So in other words, there is time involved and there is state involved. So let's say the first player comes. And the first player is at the root of the node here. The first player is this, is this blue triangle. And the mediator looks, looks at node A in, in the lookup table that, that is generated by this uh, pure strategy profile pi. And the mediator says, OK, at, at node A, uh, blue, you should go left. And blue might say, OK, great. I'll go left. And then orange shows up. And orange may not know what blue just did. The, the, the game might have imperfect information. That's fine. So in this case, um, the mediator looks at information set B in the lookup table and tells orange, orange, you should also play left. Um, orange just goes, no, I don't want to. And that's also fine. You can do whatever you want. Orange goes right. Now the mediator. Now it's blue's turn again. The mediator looks at looks at um, blue's information set, which is C, and says, "Blue, you should play right." Blue goes right. And now, since orange has already disobeyed one of the mediator's recommendations, the convention that we're going to adopt, and for those of you familiar with with revelation principle like things, this is this is without loss of generality due to the revelation principle, but I won't get into that. Um, the convention that we're going to adopt is that if a player has deviated, they will no, they will no longer receive recommendations. So orange is deviated. Orange will no longer receive recommendations. Orange is sad because they're no longer receiving recommendations, but has to choose something to do anyway. So let's say orange goes right, and let's say the game ends there. OK, so we're going, to be working, we're going to be working in this talk with several different notions of correlation. And the different notions of correlation that we're going to use are defined by how, uh, when players are allowed to deviate. So the, so the definition that I just, so the notion that I just introduced is called the extensive form correlated equilibrium. And in extensive form correlated equilibrium, basically, the agents are allowed to do whatever they want. So they can deviate whenever they want, before or after listening to messages, whatever. And this was introduced by von Stengel and Forge in 2008. And now we can, we can restrict when the agents are allowed to deviate to get coarser and coarser notions of equilibrium. So an extensive form coarse correlated equilibrium is a, a mediator profile such that no player wants to deviate before receiving a recommendation. So in extensive form coarse correlated equilibrium, the difference is once, a mediator, uh, once an agent sees a recommendation, they have to play it. The agent is allowed to not see a recommendation, in which case they can do whatever they want. But the moment they see a recommendation, they're, they're bound to play it. And the third and coarsest notion of equilibrium we'll, we'll be working with is a normal form coarse correlated equilibrium, which is by far the oldest. Um, and in normal form coarse correlated equilibrium, you're only allowed to deviate at the beginning of the game. So at the very beginning of the game, you have to make this binary choice. Am I, going to do, am I going to have the complete freedom to do whatever I want but receive no recommendations? Or am I going to bind myself to obeying every single recommendation the mediator gives me? Those are the only two things I'm allowed to do. You might be thinking at this point, for those of you in the room familiar with notions of correlation, why, why am I not considering the normal form correlated equilibrium? And that's because that sort of breaks a paradigm that I've introduced in, on, on the previous slide. And, and, the parag and, and the paradigm that I've introduced here is that the mediator is giving the players incremental uh, recommendations. Whereas in the normal form correlated equilibrium, um, the mediator is revealing the whole strategy to the player up front. So the mediator in normal form correlated equilibrium is revealing a lot more information to the player. That sort of breaks the model that we have here. We're not going to get into, uh, that, into that. That's a significantly harder problem. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, correlation, correlated equilibria arise naturally all over the place. So for example, in practice, anytime there's, there's this mediator that can suggest but not enforce behavior. So for example, mediated negotiations, conflict resolution, crowdsourcing, ride sharing is a common example that people use these days. It's also a reasonable computational relaxation of Nash equilibria when Nash is too, too hard to find. And recent work shows that it also arises a long-term behavior of certain learning dynamics. And I won't get into that here, but that's, but that's also an interesting uh, way to think about correlation in extensive form games. It's, it's, it's in some sense, as far as we know right now, the tightest notion that we can get via learning dynamics. And in this paper specifically, in this talk specifically, I'll be interested in optimal correlated equilibrium. What's an optimal correlated equilibrium? It's simply one that maximizes a certain ob objective function in expectation. So for example, you can think, you can think of social welfare maximization, um, and, that's, and that's completely fine. Our paper is general to any, to any objective function, but social welfare already enca encapsulates all the difficulty. So you can think of social welfare. Under all three of these notions, um, computing an optimal correlated equilibrium or computing the value of the optimal correlated equilibrium is NP-hard, even to approximate to some, to some additive constant. And this is due to von Schenkel and Forge, um, and you tack the PCP theorem on top of that because they use a reduction from set. Sure. Okay. We are not the first to study this problem. Um, some special cases are known to be solvable in polynomial time, including uh, so-called triangle-free games. This is due to work by Gabriela Farina and Thomas Sandholm. Um, as I mentioned, finding one extensive form correlated equilibrium is easy. This is due to Huang and von Stengel, and, also, and this is also possible by, by, via learning dynamics, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, there are algorithms based on column generation or like double oracle or single oracle, if you want to think about it that way, that are known. But these are, these are often slow, both in theory and practice. We'll, dis we'll also discuss as part of this paper improvements to the column generation. But for now, let's talk about fixed parameter algorithms. Okay. The main result that I'm going to talk about in this section is that all three of these, in all three of these notions, we can compute optimal correlated equilibrium by solving a linear problem with fixed parameter size. Now, what do we mean by fixed parameter size here? And I think the easiest way for me to explain, explain this is to simply state the size of the LP. And here we go. Um, so as we can see, um, in, in all three notions, we get different sizes of the LP. And this O star here, with this O star here, I'm hiding factors that are polynomial in the size of the game. So we're focusing only on the exponential term here, which has to be there because MP hardness. And as we can see, the, the, the exponential term here only depends on a few things. It only depends on, for example, the, 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 in this case, the branching factor, the depth, and this parameter K, which I'll spend a decent amount of time focusing on. And this, and this parameter K is what, what we call the information complexity. It's the maximum number of private states per public state. And I'm going to very quickly define this in a moment. But, but I want to emphasize that this K is the only, is, is the only thing in the exponent here. So, in particular, when this k is a constant, we get a polynomial time algorithm. Okay. And yeah, as I've said, these three things are concretely different. Like we get different linear program size bounds for each of these three things. And I'll come back to that. And I'll come back to that later. Okay. So what is this, this, this parameter k? I'll tell you in one slide right now. So suppose that we have two players, each of which, each of whom rolls a six-sided die that is their private information. Then k is twelve. It is, simply the, it is simply the sum of the number of possible private states for each player. So of course, in a lot of games, this parameter is going to be big. This is unavoidable because NPR this. But there will be games for which this k is small. So for example, so, so for example uh, there, there are a lot of games in which there is no random chance at all. And, or, or even the game is complete information. And in these cases, and in these cases k is very small. Okay. So, uh, at this point, I'll briefly go over the, the proof of all three of those results. They, they follow a very, very similar structure. I'll just give a general high-level idea of, of, of what the difficulty is in that proof. The main concern that we have is to represent the decision problem that the mediator faces in, 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 trying, in, in trying to convince the players to, to follow their recommendations. So our goal is to simply explicitly represent this decision problem. If we can explicitly represent what the mediator is allowed to do, then we can write the incentive, con incentive compatibility constraints around that, which I won't show, but is not that difficult. Um, and then we can compute optimal equilibria. OK, so decision points in this decision, decision problem will correspond to sets of possible histories, including recommendations. And, we, and, and these sets have to be consistent with some public state. So, so we're going to be breaking down the, ga the game into observations that are public and private, which, are, which I won't show explicitly, but think of the game as broken down into these public and private observations. And the mediator observes what is public, 
And conditioned on that public information, the mediator and me the mediator puts together the set of possible true, true histories, including recommendations that could have happened up to that point. So here's a possible decision point. Um, sorry. And yeah, here's a possible decision point at a node, let's say it's player one's turn. Okay? And okay, so there's two possible things in this decision point. The first thing is that the history could be A and nobody is deviated. And I'm just making up letters here. You could think of A and B as two different histories. And second, the second possibility is that the history is B, but player two has already deviated somewhere. There was some node before D, and player two at that node has, has received the recommendation and not followed it. And these are the possible two states, let's just say. Yeah, so true history is B, but player two deviated. At a decision point, what the mediator has to do is the mediator has to select an action to recommend at each true info set of player one under the usual, yeah, so at each node under the usual information set constraints. So in this case, let's say the mediator, so let's say the mediator says play action zero at A, play action one at B. That's a valid thing for the mediator to say. Then the mediator observes something, and let's say, in this, in, let's say that in this game, it happens to be the case that the action that player one takes is public. So maybe the mediator, so maybe, maybe player one does something, and the mediator observes that player one played action one. Okay, then there are two possibilities, right? Either the history was A, the player was recommended zero and played action one. If that was the case, then the history is now A with one appended to it, and player one deviated. So player one was recommended to play zero, but actually played one. So now the deviation is not empty anymore. Or the history is B, player one rec was recommended to play action one, and, the player, and player one did not deviate. So we still have this recorded deviation from player two, but player one didn't deviate. Now note, I'm only recording one deviation here. You don't need to record two deviations, because we're only considering, we're only considering the possibility that one player can deviate. So we don't need to, need to consider the case where two players have deviated. Okay. So our goal is, is going to be simply to bound the size of this stack. So for each player and each private state that that player could have, either that player has obeyed all the recommendations so far, in which case we have to choose one of the B actions to recommend, or the player has deviated. If the player has deviated, we have to select where that player has deviated and what recommendation that, that, that player was given to cause it to deviate. So in each private state, for each private state, there are roughly BD choices. In other words, we have a BD to the K bound on size. And I'm intentionally being fuzzy here. So there's BDK, there's some polynomial factors. I'm, I'm, intention, I'm, I'm intentionally dropping these. Okay. So in other words, for extensive form correlated equilibrium, the, the dominant, the, the exponential term that we get is going to be this BD to the K. Okay. For extensive form coarse correlated equilibrium, we can do slightly better than this. Because in extensive form coarse correlated equilibrium, we don't actually care, or in, or in fact, the, the player is not going to receive a recommendation when, the, when they deviate. So we're going to drop this B times D because we don't need to select where and when, we only need to select where. So instead of B times D, we get B plus D. In normal form course correlated equilibrium, we don't, the player doesn't receive any recommendations at all when they deviate. So we can erase all of this, and we just get a B plus one. Either the player has deviated, or, or, or we recommend one of the B actions. So that's where all three of these size bounds come from. And now I want to note that there is a fundamental difference between these two, between the first two bounds here, this b plus one and this b plus d, in that in this b plus d to the k, there's this extra, extra parameter d. And you might ask, is it possible to get rid of this dependence on the depth of the game? That, that, that seems to be an annoying thing to depend on. Is it possible to, to have a bound for these last two cases that only depends on the branching factor and k? And the answer is no. So under, under reasonable assumptions, um, this, this, this gap that we have here between these first two things, this addition of the, of the extra parameter, is fundamental, okay? Um, we don't show that the parameter has to be the depth, but we do show that we cannot do it with only branching factor and k. Okay. Now, I, want, I just want to briefly go over what to do when this parameter is large. Okay. So when this parameter is too large, the previous algorithm won't work. It will just simply run out of memory because trying to, trying to build that DAG is too cumbersome. Okay, so what do we do? Um, so there are exp exponentially pure, many pure strategy profiles, and the mediator can pick an arbitrary distribution over them. So one thing to do, well, one, one thing you might think about is, as I've written on this slide, column generation. I'm going to incrementally generate pure strategy profiles, and I'm going to only consider distributions over those. And I'm going to add strategy profiles and add strategy profiles, so, uh, so on, until, until I've added enough that I can you know, parameterize 
and, 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 until I can prove that what I've been doing is optimal. OK. So the first attempt at column generation is simply to, to do this. We add strategy profiles one by one. And so let's say, let's say we have two strategy profiles. We're only allowed to mix between these two, these two strategy profiles. That's quite a restrictive thing. right? OK. The second attempt is to say, OK, one of these players is going to be allowed to mix arbitrarily. The other player has to choose a pure profile. So in this case, with only, with only support of size two, we get all of these pure, we, 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 get a, we, get, we are allowed to mix between all of these pure strategy profiles. What we do is we, is we build upon this. So, so both of those attempts have been done by others. What we do is we build upon this. We say, OK, not only, not only can one player do this, we're going to allow both players to do this, and we're going to dynamically pick which one is playing the pure strategy and which one is mixing. So in other words, not only do we get the column, we also get the row. Okay? And so this, this creates a much tighter program, and tighter programs mean faster convergence for column generation. Okay, so, so, so again, a comparison of our methods. Um, the correlation DAG has fixed parameter guarantees. Column generation does not. Column generation is an anytime algorithm. You can stop it at any time. The correlation DAG has to build the whole correlation DAG before even starting anything. Memory usage for column generation to polynomial for, for correlation DAG, it's not better than the runtime. When k is small, correlation DAG will be faster. When k is large, column generation will be, will, be, will be faster. And very briefly, some experiments. So basically, in every single game we tested, one of our two algorithms, depending on k, as you might expect, was the state of the art, often, often by multiple orders of magnitude. So in the future, um, questions that we might ask include, can we get a best of both worlds algorithm? that has both the, the, the worst case performance of our algorithm but the convenient properties of column generation and is better than both in practice. Can we do, can we do everything that we've done here while also subsuming earlier special cases such as triangle freeness? I didn't get into that here, but suffice to say, our paper doesn't quite subsume these earlier polynomial time results for some weird technical reasons. So, so it's interesting to think about whether it is possible to subsume those while maintaining, while maintaining this fixed, fixed parameter tractability. Is there an extension to normal form correlated equilibrium? As I said, I sort of punted on that question, but it, it would be interesting to revisit that. And is the B plus D versus BD gap between EFCC and EFCE that I mentioned, that, that, that we discussed, somehow also fundamental? This would require some sort of fine-grained lower bound analysis. OK. And can regret minimization also yield these optimal correlated equilibrium? This we don't know. Great. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Cool. So we have time for a few questions. Does anyone have any questions? OK, I have a question. So uh, you have this like B plus 1 versus B plus D thing, yes. right? Yes. And so one thing you can do is you can create kind of like a stupid caterpillar game or decision space, right? Like where instead of making my decisions all at one decision point where I had many, I sort of like one at a time decide, do I take this action or go down the caterpillar, yep. right? And so that's kind of like a stupid large D yes. example. Yes. Um, and I guess one thing that happens in sort of like this like first order methods literature was that we used to have a dependence on D, but then it became a dependence on the L1 norm of the volatile instead. Hmm. Do you think something like this, like because like D is kind of like artificial sometimes. Yeah. Right? And so I, I wonder if that kind of idea could be one way to have a more sort of like specifically dependent on the actual size of the decision space. Um. That is possible. That that yeah, is. I, mean, I, I, I haven't I haven't thought about this, but that would that, that would be an interesting possibility. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Cool. All right. Uh, thanks again, Brian. Uh, so.